Christ and to rejoice and celebrate together. I'm glad that each of you are here this morning to worship the Lord on this Christmas morning. That's what we want to do uh, today is rejoice in Him that He has come and that He is coming again. And aren't you excited for that? We don't look just to the past and we don't look to Christ only His birth, but to His coming again. And we're thankful for that. For our scripture reading this morning, as we begin, if you would, look at Luke chapter 2 today. I think obviously a fairly fitting passage to begin with for our opening scripture. And so if you would, look at Luke chapter 2, maybe a little longer reading than our typical opening scripture. But as we begin today, we're going to read of the birth of Christ, Luke chapter number 2. And we'll begin reading in verse number 1, and we'll read down through a good portion of the chapter, probably just through verse number 20 today, and then we'll pray and we'll sing some songs together, rejoice and worship the Lord. Verse number one, if you would, it says, I'll read and then we'll make our way down to the end of this section. It says, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his spouse wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. And wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you, is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, let's all read verse 14 together. Ready? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go now, even... And see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. I want you to notice this morning as we pray, notice a few things. In verse number 10, it says that the angel of the Lord said to fear not. And that should be our response and that Jesus has come to bring us peace and not fear. Verse 11, he says, for unto you is born this day. Isn't it amazing that the Bible says that the Son of God was born unto us. And then, of course, the praise that the angels sang that we read together. And that should be our response, as in verse 20, that we glorify and praise God for all that we find in him. And so let's ask him to help us do that this morning. Lord, we do come before you today, and we praise you for sending your Son. Uh, this was not a last-ditch effort. It was, it was not just a, a try that you put out there, hoping that maybe it would work to save us. This was your plan all along. You tell us that even before the foundations of the world, that Jesus Christ was set for our atonement, and we thank you for that. We praise you for it. We thank you that he came in the fullness of time exactly when he did, and that as people waited for the coming Messiah, that your promise to them over and over and over, that you would make a way to commune with them, that you would make a way to 
live with them and uh, be a part of our lives. And we praise you for that. But we're thankful this morning that you didn't leave it as that extended relationship, but that you sent your very son, that you came to dwell with us. You came to live as us and among us and that you lived for us, that you died on our behalf and that you are risen again. And this morning, as we come, as we have talked about all throughout this month, that as we come, we now wait, as many before us and before you came waited for the coming Messiah to appear, who would it be? We now wait, knowing that it is Jesus Christ, with the promise that he will return and come again. And so we ask you that you would do it, that you would do it soon. That, Lord, you would set all things according to your plan, make all things right, make all things new. But that while we wait, we would serve and worship, glorify and praise you. Fill us with your spirit in an evident way today. I'm thankful, so thankful for each one that is here. <clears throat> and I pray that you would bless us as we look to your word and as we take the Lord's Supper, a communion together to signify our hope in you. We have the many that are traveling this morning, spread across different portions even of the country, that you would encourage them this morning, our family, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that uh, today your church would be encouraged, that we would be empowered as we remember uh, that you sent yourself, that you came to save us from our sins. And we will praise you for it. Fill us as we rejoice and as we worship and praise you. And may we follow in obedience to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stand with us. Hark the herald angels sing. A glorious truth this morning that when he comes again, not as a baby and not in humility or weakness in terms of human sense, but he will come in power, resurrected, ready to make alive all those who he has redeemed. And we praise the Lord for that this morning. Turn in your Bible this morning, if you would, to Matthew chapter number one. We'll read a portion of this morning's passage. Most of this morning's service is going to be given over to taking communion or the Lord's Supper together. I think it's a fitting day to do so as we declare what we believe that Jesus came for us and also that he is coming once more and that we partake in it. And I think it's more of a Christmas message sometimes than we think or that we dwell on. And so we're going to do that this morning. And we're going to be in a number of passages of Scripture today, which is a little unusual for us. So be ready to turn and flip from place to place. But we're going to start here in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and verse 23 in just a moment. And as we do there, you see beside you, let me make note, you have a, a gift. If you sat down in a seat that does not have a gift, then you can scoot over, you can get it on your way out. And uh, take one of those, if you would, leave any others that are still there. We have a lot of people traveling, and so over the next uh, week or two, we'll give those out to anyone who comes as part of our congregation. So if you are here this morning, we want that to be our gift to you. It's a little calendar that we give out that seems to be a Christmas tradition around here. And several of you come, and each year I use that calendar, and so there is your calendar. And then we also... We rotate some other gifts, and you see there today, there's a little a journal with the Psalms, and it is empty. It doesn't tell you anything. We've done some devotional books and things in the last few years, but this morning, that journal is empty, and that is for you to take and walk through the Psalms. Many of you read a Psalm a day, or you read them throughout the year at some point, and uh, jot down some notes about the Psalms. There's some other things, that, other ways you can use it. I've been starting to use it. I'll read a Psalm, and then I'll kind of rewrite the Psalm in my own prayer. So if you're going through Psalm 23, how has the Lord been my shepherd recently? And how has he provided for me and given me peace and restored my soul? And we've all faced valleys and shadows and write out specifically. And so hopefully that'll be a help to you. And uh, if nothing else, write out your thoughts about the psalm and then pass it on to your kids and let them read it uh, throughout the years to come. But hopefully that'll be a blessing to you. And uh, that's our gift to each of you this morning. If you would look at Matthew chapter number 1 and down in verse number 22, just a very short. Actually, we'll start in verse 21. and uh, See, I always do that. Verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled 
which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Not just among us, but communing with us, living with us in relationship, not just to us, but relationship with us. So we're going to think on that this morning. Emmanuel, God with us. Let's ask him to help us. Father, your word is sure and it is true. And we thank you for it. You have proven this once already. And that you promised to send your son. You promised to come yourself. You promised us, Emmanuel, that God would live with us. And you did. You came and dwelt among us as Jesus, in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, yourself, made flesh for us. You took on weakness. You took on our infirmities. You took on our troubles. You took on the humility of your own creation that you did not have to do, but in love and mercy. You displayed yourself for us. You manifest the love of God and showed it to us by becoming like us. And that you lived for us and died for us and you live for us again. And so as we dwell on this thought, Emmanuel, that God has come to live with us, may we also rejoice as we look forward that you have promised it again. That you have promised that you will dwell with us once more. And this time for eternity. And so we ask that you would lift up our hearts, point us, center us this morning on this truth. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, this morning we're going to be giving most of our time over to this thought of communion this morning. And uh, we read just a moment ago in Matthew chapter 1 that the coming, the first coming of Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophets saying that God would come and dwell with us. And he did just that. He came and he dwelt with us as us. And we praise the Lord for that. And I want you to think this morning as we begin that Christmas by its very essence is about communion. And I don't just mean communion in the sense that we pick up these plates and we pass a physical bread and physical crackers and that we pass the juice and we drink of it. I don't, I don't mean the, the symbolism of it, but that Christmas is about communion in this sense. That there, there's other aspects that we tend to think about with Christmas. There's other elements of Jesus' birth and the account of it that we often think of at Christmas time. And while they're special things, they are not the driving theme behind Jesus coming to earth. In fact, if we allow and leave the Christmas story where it is in Matthew 1 and in Luke 1 and 2, if we leave it there, we do an injustice to what God actually intends for us to see. We think of the long trip to Bethlehem, the business of busyness of the little town with no place to stay, the little boy that was born in a stable, laid in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, the visiting shepherds and the wise men, all of those are wonderful details that give us hope because they were prophesied, they were promised of the Lord. And even the miraculous elements of Jesus' birth, the announcement to Mary and to Elizabeth, and then even John the Baptist leaping in the womb, the miraculous, the angels, the star, and uh, the declaration, the coming of the wise men, all of those are Wonderful fulfillments of prophecy that point us to who Jesus is and clue us in, this is really the Messiah. We like to think about them. We may dwell on them this time of year. However, on their own and of themselves, they are not the primary central thought of the importance around this day, this Christmas celebration. The most base and most significant meaning of Christmas is about communion. As Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, we just read, it is about Emmanuel, God with us. The most amazing statement in all of the account of the Christmas story and the birth of Christ is that God lived among us. God is transcendent. How do, you, how do we know that this is the primary theme of Christmas? Because it's also the primary theme of all of Scripture. 
From the start, from the creation of man, the theme of mankind has been communion with its creator. That the loss of that communion is horrific. That the loss of that communion leads to darkness and struggle and turmoil and trial and hopelessness. But that access to that communion leads to hope and promise. God is transcendent from his creation. That means he sits outside of his creation. He, is, he does not need it. He is not dependent on it. He's greater than the sum total of everything that he has made. Yet, God also interacts with his creation. And particularly with man. He created us in his image. And he created us for communion with him. A different type of relationship and communion than anything else that he created. As God created Adam and Eve, he placed them into the garden. That garden was about communion. He came, the Bible says he came and he walked with them and he dwelt with them and he lived among them and that heaven would uh, come down and condescend to earth that constantly Adam and Eve were in this constant relationship and communion with their Lord. He gave them responsibility. He gave them an ability to communicate with him and an opportunity to reflect and glorify him on this earth. And by their love toward them, by the dis display of their obedience toward him. However, that communion that God created human beings to have was broken. We know that, um, that God promised a way that that, excuse me, we know that uh, sin broke that communion, that it separates us from him. At the core of God's transcendence is his holiness. That is his separateness from all of creation. And at the root of his holiness and what separates him from everything else in creation is his righteousness, his sinlessness, that he cannot dwell with sin, that by his very nature he is not sin. In fact, we define sin rightly by God's character. That sin is a failure to glorify God. That sin is a failure to display God's character and his nature. That sin is a failure to submit to God's position as our creator. So sin by its very nature is a brokenness of communion with God. That's where we begin this Christmas story. Because God promised a way that sinful men would be able to make contact with him. And he promised an eventual full restoration, an eternal communion. But this would have to be God's doing, not our own. Our efforts and our good deeds, our righteousness will never be enough to gain access or communion and relationship with God again. It won't be because we have earned it back. It will only be because he comes to us. It will only be because he communes and he comes and he promises this sending of someone who would come and make things right. The fact is he promised that he himself would come to restore communion with us. But in the meantime, we know we're going to do a, a small Bible history if we're going from front to back, not quite in detail, but that God made a way that sinful men could remake contact with him. Originally, he did this in a way, and we see it in the Old Testament, he provided this sacrificial system. And this system was never meant to be the ultimate form of redemption, but rather it was to picture what is coming. The sacrifices that we read about in the Old Testament were not redeeming of themselves. The New Testament tells us that the blood and flesh of animals didn't actually save anyone, but rather it was a picture of the one that was coming. Because God designed this substitutionary sacrificial system to allow man to continue in, in some form, co continue communion with him. Because when Adam and Eve, that communion was broken. Remember, when they sinned, what did they, very first thing they did, they hid from God. They ran from him. Because in their sin, they could not stand before him. And yet God in his mercy provides a way. Even in that moment, he makes a sacrifice for Adam and he, he clothes them with the skin of a ram or of a goat or of a lamb, picturing his coming promise, what he would one day do in their sin and in and for their lives. So God makes this promise and he says, I'm going to come and restore communion with all those that believe and are my children. But in the meantime, we're going to, 
create, the, we're going to have this system that pictures what I will one day do for you. And there was the sacrificing of animals that as a substitute, something innocent died for the sins of something that was guilty. And for a while, this allowed men to approach God and for God to work on the part of the people. And the reason that this system worked was because it was a shadow of the eventual perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It freed God up and man to dwell in covenant with one another for the time being. But as part of this system of sacrifice, the covenant of God to man and man to God, the Lord established this system of worship. And God had, in that time, an altar and a table. And you see them referenced. And they were used for different things. And there was lambs and animals that were slain or killed upon the altar. Their blood was shed and their lives were lost or taken on behalf of sinful people to picture what would one day happen in Jesus Christ. You say, well, why did it have to happen over and over and over and over again? Because God was showing you cannot earn this yourself. It's only a picture to remind you over and over and over. And so you say, well, how is this a Christmas message? We're getting there. We're getting there, I promise. So you have God in the Old Testament that says, communion has been broken. And I'm going to reestablish it one day. In the meantime, come to the altar and find forgiveness. Come to the table and find fellowship. There's all sorts of different sacrifices described in the Old Testament. There would be uh, rams and goats and birds and all these different things that they would sacrifice. And it would picture the atonement that God had toward their sin is forgiveness displayed then they would also do things. They would break bread. They would, uh, they would bring drink. They would pour it out. And there would be this table that the showbread even would be described. It would be laid out as a, a, for a time to represent God's provision, but also their worship of God being displayed. And eventually the priests would take those things and God provided for them and they would eat of them. They would partake of them. I want you to turn, if you would, to Malachi chapter Number one for a moment. If you're in Matthew, it's probably only Matthew one still. It's probably only two, three pages backwards. But I want you to look in Malachi chapter one this morning for a moment. Because this beautiful picture that God made communion, it's all about communion with between God and man. And so for just a moment, I want to look at this Lord's table, this thought of communion. And I kind of want to steal for a moment a thematic story structure from Charles Dickens. This was not on purpose, okay? I did not sit down. If I ever do something like this, I should be fired. But I did not steal this. I'm clarifying. I did not sit down and say, let's think about Ebenezer Scrooge and how we could turn this into a sermon. However, it just happened to see it as I was looking. In the story of Scrooge, you have this man who has kind of forgotten the joy of life. He's forgotten everything that life is supposed to be and intended to be. He's forgotten relationships, and he is consumed with himself and inanimate objects that he owns and has and the power of success that he may attain. And in it, there's these three spirits, ghosts, that come and remind him of what life is supposed to be about. And what are they? They're the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. And so I want to steal that for a moment. Actually, I'm not going to steal it. Maybe Charles, I'm going to say Charles Dickens stole it from a, th a theme of Scripture that we're going to look back and look at communion past, communion present, and communion future. And let's look for just a moment. Malachi chapter 1 is going to give us communion past. We could walk through the whole Old Testament to look at God's communion, his intent to dwell among his people, to fellowship, to be worshipped by them and to bless them. And constantly they rebelled and broke it, rebelled and broke it, rebelled and broke it over and over and over again. Their sacrifices didn't necessarily stop, but their hearts ran away from the Lord. They didn't stop making the bread until they were in exile. But their hearts had run from him. Their spirits were away from the Lord. Communion had been broken. I want you to look at Malachi chapter 1. This is one of the last places in the Old Testament that God speaks to his people before he actually comes in person. One of the final prophets to minister to God's people. And notice the description of what communion was like just before, or a few hundred years before, Jesus comes. Verse number 6. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be father, where is mine honor? 
And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts? Unto you, O priest, that despise my name, and you say, wherein have we despised thy name? You have offered polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? And then that ye say, the, Lord, the table of the Lord is contemptible. In other words, the, the priests were coming to the table, they were offering, the people were offering the, the least of what they had, the oldest, the worst of what they had. And then the priest even had become contemptible toward the Lord's table. They were despising it, saying, we're tired of doing this. Then in verse 8, and if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? If you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee and accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? He says, you treat people better than you treat your God. Notice in verse number 9. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This have been by your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. He has come to these people and he said, Your offerings are valueless to me because your heart is not fixed on me. Your actions and your supposed obedience because of your spirit is ignored by the Lord. Communion is broken. Verse number 11. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name. And a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. He says, there's coming a day where not just the people of Israel and the family of God and the children that he has chosen, but that people from all over the world, from all over the planet, from every family, tribe, nation, tongue, Everyone, there will be people of everyone that kneel and praise the Lord that have communion with him. And they say, how sad is it that God's children don't recognize that where they are right now? And he says, your heart is distant from me. One day, every knee is going to bow before the Lord. But right now, your heart is stiff and cold against me. Then notice verse number 12. But you have profaned it in that you say, the table of the Lord is polluted. And the fruit thereof, even as meat, is contemptible. He said also, Behold, what a weariness is it. You've snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. You brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick. Now, let's skip down to verse 14. But cursed be the deceiver which hath his flock a male and voweth sacrifice unto the Lord and corruptible thing. Notice God's description of himself. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts. My name is dreadful, even among the heathen, it says. There's many examples in the Old Testament of the table, the altar of the Lord. But here you have this concise explanation that God's people had left communion with God, even by their own choice. God gave his people an opportunity. And rather than embracing communion with what God offered, they found a way to make it a burden. They tried to cheapen it. They tried to sell it out. They tried to find the most convenient way for them to get through so that God's wrath wouldn't be poured out on them. They didn't want God's wrath, but they also didn't want God's fellowship. They didn't want punishment, but they also didn't want relationship. They were consumed with what was around them. They offered the worst. Do you see the description? They offered the worst of what they had, the lame, the broken, the sick, the blind, the unproductive. People were weary, it says. We're weary of this. We're tired of the inconvenience. They were impatient. They were ungrateful toward the Lord's blessing. Even the priest had grown tired of the monotony of the sacrifices and the food that was provided them. It was ugly. It was really, really ugly. And it displeased God. And so one of the final scenes in the Bible that we have before Jesus in baby form is born is God pleading and promising his people that he loved and provided a way for. And their response is impatience, frustration, and a pathetic effort. They completely were distracted from the beauty, the greatness, and the glory of their God. And God and communion with him became an inconvenience. So that's communion past, when man of his own efforts. But now let's look at communion present. Look, if you would, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 for just a moment. 
Let's look at the description of Jesus establishing a new covenant, a new way, ultimately a new table for his people. See, there was this covenant before in which God said, I promise I'm going to come and in the meantime use this altar and use this table to represent the, the atonement for sin and fellowship with God and his people. Now Jesus has been born. We've passed the Christmas story. Jesus has grown as an adult. He disciples. He preaches the kingdom of God. And now he's about to go give himself a sacrifice for the people. But what does he do just before that sacrifice? Luke chapter 22. Look, if you would, down in verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I want to stop for a moment. That word desire there, it's actually the same word. Now, don't mistake it. He's not using it in sinful form. But it's the same root word that's used in other places in the New Testament to describe lust and yearning, a, a just overdriven passion for something. And Jesus says, I have yearned to eat this and to, and to sit with you and to fellowship with you, to have this Passover. I've longed for it. This is God. Picture this. Mankind rejects communion with God and, and looks at his table and looks at all that he has asked of them as an inconvenience, and they're just tired and sick of it. God comes, is born, and dwells with man. And now he sits down, God himself sits down with human beings and says, oh, I have wanted to do this so badly for so long. Do, do you see the picture? I mean, do you see the glory of this communion? God comes to man and doesn't say, now I've got something to show you. Now I'm going to show you how it's really done. And he doesn't speak to them with vehemence or attitude. He sits with them and in passion looks across at people who he will redeem. And he says, oh, I've longed to sit with you. And then notice, if you would, verse 16, or excuse me, verse um, 15. He said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to, unto them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after the supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth and is as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Of course, they began to inquire among themselves who would do that. But I want you to look back at this description of this Lord's Supper that we now do to signify and show that we have faith and hope that Jesus has told us the truth, that Jesus has come and said, I have longed to be with you, and I long to be with you again. And he promises his disciples and ultimately us that he will come. So notice the contrast. The people in their own efforts to commune with God show impatience, weariness, disgust, disappointment, apathy, selflessness, and failure. But when Jesus comes and sits with his people and communes, he shows desire. Verse 17, he shows thanks. The, the verses that describe the cup and the bread and the breaking of his body, the pouring out of his blood, he, he says this is love. A representative of a broken body, the cup picturing blood poured out, Jesus establishes relationship and communion, and it costs him deeply. And then there is rejoicing, there is glory. There was this perfecting of the sacrifice that we couldn't offer. And Jesus at this last supper is saying, I've desired this, I am thankful for this, I love this, and I am looking. He says there's hope in it as well because I'm going to do this again with you one day. Did you catch that as he said it, both the cup and the bread? He says, I will not eat this again. I will not drink this again until I sit with you in person. So Jesus makes this promise and he speaks of hope. Do you see the communion that is described? So mankind, communion is broken by sin. Yet God's love toward us is so great. 
that he says, I have desired this. I have sent my only son to be born, yes, in humble circumstances, but to die as a sacrifice on your behalf, to establish a new covenant and this promise of what is to come. There's hope that is declared. Jesus knows that he is physically going to be departing from them, and he's leaving them with a different type of communion. He promises later, the Holy Spirit's going to come and comfort you, and you won't have to... In, in, Here's the picture that Jesus is giving, ultimately. The Old Testament, you have an altar and you have a table that shows sacrifice and fellowship. And Jesus says, we're going to do away with those. Because the altar that you have brought animal after animal to, those were insufficient. The table that you have brought bread, even in bad attitudes, that is insufficient. I'm going to be a new altar and a new sacrifice, and I'm going to establish a new table. This is your new bread, the new offering. This is the new blood. And you can now come and stand before God with this Holy Spirit even dwelling in you. You can have God with us even now. As present as Jesus was physically, the Holy Spirit is now present with us spiritually. And God says, I want to commune with you. And he says, so lay aside the old altar in your own efforts. Lay aside the own table in your own bread. I will offer bread and blood that will never deteriorate, that will never pass away. My body, my sacrifice for you will establish communion forever. There will be no need for temple. There will be no need for place. There will be no need for you to bring anything. What you have brought has not been sufficient. What I bring will be eternal. And then I want you to notice, finally, this morning, this communion future. Jesus brings about the remembrance of the perfect sacrifice, the beautiful promise. Look at me with 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Another familiar passage to us when it comes to communion. And dwelling with us. So he brings about remembrance of this perfect sacrifice and he shows desire, thanks, love, hope, and praise. That's what God thinks of communion with us. That's what God thinks of relationship with us. He loves it. He is thankful for it. He declares hope and praise in it. And from time to time, we Christians are called to come together and pass a cup and eat bread, not to gain clout or status with God. We are called to do this this morning to signify that we have hope that we will one day do this in the presence of God. That's the command that he gives us. Look if you would, 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 1. For I have received of the Lord that which I have delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Take it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also took he the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament of my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. This is the beauty of what we're going to do this morning. The physical act of communion, even on Christmas morning is no more spiritual than what you will eat or drink later today. It is a picture. It doesn't change anything about you as a person, but it is a symbol. It is a declaration of what you believe to be true about Jesus. And that is that he wants and desires to have relationship with you here while on this earth, but that he promises perfect relationship with you one day when he comes again. And so this morning for communion, we don't just look back and say, God came and dwelt with us. And we don't just look inward and say, God is dwelling with us in his spirit. But we look forward and we say, God will one day dwell with us in person, eternally, forever. And we say, as significant as the Christmas story, his first coming is, we look again to the promise of his soon return. And so as we think about this this morning, one final passage, look if you would, Revelation 19. By taking this, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, we just read it, by doing this, you declare God's death until he comes. You declare we don't need an altar and we no longer need a table because we have a Savior. 
And so when we take the bread and the cup, we are not saying we need these things. We are saying Jesus gave us these things. We are no longer saying, I have to do this to appease God. We can say God did this to appease his wrath on our behalf. And one day, because of this, and this is what we look for in our own moment of Advent, if you would, Revelation 19, verse, pick up in verse number 5. A voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready, and uh, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now notice verse 9, and he saith unto me, write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are true sayings of God. And so we have this one day promise that God will bring his bride. He describes it that way because of his love and his commitment and his protection and provision over us, God will call his bride to himself, and there will be a feast, an actual feast in the very presence of God. And on this Christmas morning, we don't look back and just say, I wish I would have been there. I wish I could have seen the angels. I wish I could have held the baby Jesus. I wish I could have seen the wise men give their gifts. No, we look forward to a time which Jesus will call all of us to himself and sit down at his table and for eternity have what we have not had yet in person. We've had a taste of it. But from the very beginning, God says, I'm going to create man to dwell in communion with me. We've broken it with sin. He provides a sacrifice temporarily, but in Jesus, he provides a sacrifice eternally. And by faith in him, we have this promise that one day we will sit because he will come again forever. Think about all those years, hundreds of years that people said, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. And eventually their excitement turned to this drollness. Oh, the yeah, sure, the Messiah is going to come. Even in almost sarcasm, sure, yeah, one day he's going to come and show up. So much so that eventually they missed him when he did come. So how is your spirit this morning to communion with God? It's great to celebrate Christmas and say, oh, Jesus came as a baby for us, but he came for you. He desires relationship with you now. Do you view your relationship with Jesus this morning more like the old people in the old covenant with apathy and disdain and you're tired of it and it's a burden to have to follow God and obey him and seek him in his word and live in relationship with him? Are you tired of that? We look at them and point a finger. How could they act like that when they had the promise of the Messiah? How can we live as we do cold and dry toward the Lord when we have a promise that he is coming soon to dwell again with us? We have the same promise, but in a better way. And so this morning as we come to his table, may we look for him in the past. May we acknowledge him in the present and may we point to him in the future because the universe will one day, because he is Savior, kneel before him. And to that we may still say to one another in that day, Merry Christmas. Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us now as we take this cup and this bread, the communion. We ask that our hearts would point toward you. We are glad that you came as a baby. We are glad for the stall. We are glad for all the events of your birth. But we are more glad that you did not come to dwell once, but you came that we would dwell with you forever. And so help us now. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. I'm going to ask the men that are preparing to come and help with uh, communion, uh, if they would, go ahead and prepare and go ahead and come on to the front. And as we do, as they're getting ready to come, you, you may ask, well, who can take communion today? We say, we're, we're visiting, and, and 
we're new to your church or we're visiting with family and we believe as a church that God calls any Christian to come and stand before him and to rejoice in the sacrifice that he has given. And so we're thankful for that this morning. So if you're here this morning and you're a Christian and you stand before God and he has saved you, redeemed you from your sin, then we invite you to partake in this. So what does it do? Does it make me more spiritual? Does it save me? It will not save you. It will not change anything about if, if If you have not been saved, if you have not been redeemed in Christ, then we encourage you to come to him today. It, this won't be it. This won't change your relationship with God. But for those of us that are redeemed, this is a declaration of rejoicing. That we look back, Jesus came. We look in, the Holy Spirit is with us. And we look forward to our future with God for eternity. While they come, this morning I wanted to do it a little bit different. And uh, I'm going to play a song for my father. I wanted everybody on Christmas morning to be able to be with their families and, um, and, and spend time there and, and take communion with them. So I'm going to play a song. It's going to be a one-man show for a half a minute. Not a show, but I'm going to play a song and try to lead you in it. You might be familiar with it. We learned it last year at Christmas time. And so as the men are passing this out, if you would, sing with me, sing with us. And then when we're done with this, uh, passing it out, we'll partake together. <coughs> I'm going to, we're going to put the words on the screen. You can try to follow along with us as we do. Oh, come, all you unfaithful, come, weak and unstable, come. No, you are not alone. Come, barren and waiting ones, weary of praying, come, see what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born. For you, O oh, come, bitter and broken, come with fears unspoken, come taste of his perfect love. Come, kill. Oh, sorry. Oh, come, guilty and hiding ones, there is no need to run. See what your God has done. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for. the lamb who was given slain for our pardon his promise is peace for those who believe he's the lamb who was given slain for our pardon his promise is peace for those who believe, so come, though you have nothing, come, he is the offering, come, see what your God has done. Christ is born, 
Christ is born, Christ is born for you. One final time. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. Amen. You guys can come on. If you want, I'll let you guys go back to your families. And so this morning, you take a small cup with a small piece of bread, a small amount of juice, and in some ways it's representative of the small taste of communion that we have had so far. The, the small amount, and not demeaning of it, but the joy that we have found in Christ, even in our sinful bodies, the hope that we have found in Him, the wonder that we find in Him, the satisfaction that we find in Him now, even in broken sinful bodies, is a small taste of what we will one day find in Him for eternity. And so with that, we take the bread, and we will ask Him to bless it, and we will rejoice that He gave Himself for us so that we would one day be with him. Brother Madlinger, would you mind leading us in prayer for the bread? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, the day that we celebrate the birth We'll eat together. Paul said that he took the bread to represent his body, and then he also took the blood, the cup. He said, this represents the blood of my body poured out on behalf of sin and sinners that they may come and have communion with God once more. And so we take that cup today and we rejoice in it. Brother Jeff, would you lead us in prayer? We'll take the cup and rejoice in communion with him. The Bible says that after they partook of the Lord's Supper, that they sang a hymn together. They sang a song to praise and rejoice. Think about it. Jesus sang, rejoicing, that he was about to die for us. It says he gave thanks in what he would do for us. And so we rejoice with him in that. And this morning we're going to sing one final song in just a moment. I believe it's Doubt It's Leave Thy Throne. And He came to earth for us. And so as we think about it again this morning, and we rejoice in Christmas, aren't you glad that God had a desire to have a relationship with you? I mean, we didn't on our own have desire to have a relationship with Him. That, that, that is broken in us in a way that we can't even fathom. And yet He desired us. And so we come and we rejoice with him this morning. We'll be closed with this hymn. Stand if you would. Let's sing this one final Christmas carol, if you would, together. And then we'll be dismissed with this.
And I hope that you have a very, very Merry Christmas.